Hey friends, today is just a taste of the bonus content that you can normally experience monthly by clicking that big join button and becoming a channel member or by supporting over on Patreon. There's over 20 additional videos available now covering tons of crazy and interesting content. I hope you enjoy. I was eight years old when we first moved into the house on the edge of the forest. My parents had their doubts about buying a house with a backyard bordered by forest. They had concerns about the wild animals getting into our bins or hurting our dogs, and were worried one of us might go too far into the trees and get lost. But it was cheap. My dad liked the seclusion. My mom loved the house itself, and my siblings and I were excited about playing in the backyard and exploring the forest. Our first sign that something wasn't right was that our dogs were absolutely terrified of the forest. They never went into the forest for any reason. If a toy they'd been playing with found its way past the tree line, they would refuse to retrieve it, and when one of us went in, they would pace anxiously until we returned. On occasion, we'd notice the dogs staring at a spot in the forest in obvious distress, sometimes growling or barking, but we could never see anything there. My brother once carried one of the dogs into the trees to show her there was nothing scary about it, but she wriggled out of his grip and sprinted into the house in a panic. If we were in the backyard when it was getting dark, we sometimes heard noises like someone walking through the forest, sticks crunching underfoot, branches being pushed aside. If we called out, there was no response, but if we shined a flashlight around we would occasionally catch a glimpse for just a split second of something that we could swear looked like a person walking around in the dark. My parents quickly banned us from entering the forest at all after dark, and even during the day we weren't allowed to go out of sight of the house. My sister's bedroom window looked out to the backyard and the forest beyond, and she remembers looking out her window one night and seeing a shadowy figure standing right at the edge of the backyard. She said there was something wrong with it, like it wasn't quite standing on the ground, and It was a little too tall to be a person, and was sort of distorted. And she was convinced it was staring directly at her. She called for our dad, saying that there was a man in the yard staring through her window, and when he ran outside to chase off whoever it was, she continued to watch the figure. It didn't move away, but when the light from our dad's flashlight passed over it, it suddenly just wasn't there anymore. We regularly heard knocking at the back door at night, with no one there. Our parents thought it was teenagers playing pranks and stopped bothering even opening the door until one rainy night when the knocking was persistent and agitated. My mom pointed out there might be someone needing shelter from the heavy rain outside, but when she opened the door, not only was there no one there, but there were no wet footprints on the porch. The knocking continued the whole time we lived there. It would happen several times in the span of a few weeks, then stop for months and start up again. My parents eventually installed a security camera and there was never anyone at the door. The camera wasn't all useless though. About three years into living there, my brother started having night terrors and sleepwalking. When he went sleepwalking, he would always go out the back door and start walking towards the forest. My mom, being a light sleeper, would hear the door open and would run out to get him before he made it into the forest. After the third or fourth time it happened, my brother asked to see the camera footage because he wanted to see how he looked when sleepwalking, I guess thinking it'd look funny. The footage showed him walking out onto the porch, then pausing as if listening to something and shaking his head, then reluctantly walking forward as if being pulled or forcefully guided by something. One evening my dad was in the backyard and he heard my sister calling him from the forest, seemingly in distress. Thinking she'd gone exploring in the forest and fallen over and hurt herself, he ran in and started calling to her, but quickly realized it was too dark to see her and he couldn't pinpoint where her voice was coming from. 
He told her to wait where she was while he grabbed a flashlight. When he ran back inside the house for the flashlight, he saw my sister inside, safe and completely unconcerned. At the time, my dad hadn't told us about hearing my sister's voice in the forest, so when I heard my mom's voice coming from the forest months later while I was outside with the dogs one evening, I didn't question it despite the fact that I'd seen my mom inside recently and hadn't noticed her walking past me. My mom was calling to me, saying she'd gotten her sweater caught in some branches and needed me to come in and help her. As I walked in, the dog started barking, alerting my dad, who saw me through the windows wandering into the forest. He came outside and called to me, and I said I was just helping mom. He yelled back that mom was inside and I needed to run back to the house as fast as I could, which I did. After this, my parents had a fence built around the backyard and started looking for a new place. In the time between the fence being built and us moving out, it got way worse. We'd hear knocking at the door more regularly, as well as tapping on the windows as if someone was walking the perimeter of the house and trying every window. We would often hear scratching and scraping sounds on the fence and voices beyond it. My brother's night terrors got more frequent, and one night my mom didn't hear the door open when he went sleepwalking, and he woke up standing at the fence, staring into the forest with the dogs barking at him. The last morning we spent there, less than four years after we moved in, we woke up to find the back door fully open, and the security camera footage showed it slowly swing open on its own. Since moving out, my brother's sleepwalking has stopped, though he still gets night terrors and he suffers from pretty severe anxiety. A few nights ago, he called me out of the blue, and after a bit of small talk, he asked me if I think the door being open that final night means whatever was out there finally got in. He was trying to make light of it, saying he was getting into the spirit of Halloween, joking about how maybe we should all get exercise just in case something latched onto us all those years ago but I think he's deeply bothered by everything that happened. I know I still am a little. I still get nervous around dark wooded areas. I don't know what I think was out there, in the forest behind our house at night, but I get the feeling that, given the chance, it would have swallowed us whole. When I was 14 years old, I went to a church gathering on a Halloween night that was called Hallelujah Night, a Christian alternative to Halloween. My family and I would get there in the afternoon since we'd volunteer to help set up the booths, cakewalk, candy barrels, etc. But I was mostly there to get first dibs on all of the candy. After I finished helping with the usual booth I helped set up, I took a seat on a bench near the main sanctuary. It was my favorite place to sit at since I could see the entire lot and most of all the beautiful sunset. I pulled out my PSP and was scrolling through some music I had on it when some guy approached me and started a conversation. I've never been a people person so usually when things like this happen I keep the conversation short. However, this guy had this weird type of warmth to him as if he was a friend of mine. As the conversation carried on, I started to ask him if he was new because I hadn't seen him before. He told me that he had been going to this church for years, but left after an incident happened. When I asked him about the incident, he paused, looked at me and said that there's some things people pick up on that they know aren't normal. Also, that you should never get curious about things that you know you should leave alone. I had a sort of confused look on my face since I didn't know what he meant at that time. The guy noticed it and said that I would understand once I got older. I looked down at my PSP that I had in my hand still and looked back up and the guy was gone. I looked around and couldn't find him anywhere in the lot except for a few people still prepping for Hallelujah Night. It didn't make any sense. Fast forward to a few months later, I was sitting in the main sanctuary before leaving to do my usual volunteer work on the upper floor of the main sanctuary. The upper floor was a daycare area for kids, 
So at the end of the service, volunteers would escort the children downstairs, and I would go into each room shutting off the lights and making sure no children were still up there. I'll never forget getting to leave to do my usual duties when the pastor started talking about an upcoming funeral. I look at the big screens on each side of the main sanctuary and the face of that of the man I was talking to during Hallelujah Night was there. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. To this day, it still seems unreal. I was beyond shook as I made my way out of the main sanctuary into the flights of big stairs as I went to the upper floor. Once I made it up to the upper floor, another volunteer had confirmed that all the children were escorted downstairs. She noticed that I had looked sort of pale from seeing what I saw in the main sanctuary and asked me if I was okay. I told her it was nothing and proceeded to cut off all of the lights on the upper floor as she left downstairs. The upper floor was like a giant hallway with doors on each side and a door at the end of the hallway with a giant window in it. When I came to the last room at the end of the hall, I would always leave the blinds on that big window open since the light always illuminated the dark hallway and made me feel less scared. But as I left the room, I remember feeling panicked. It started freezing, and I felt like if I left that room, something was waiting for me in the darkened rooms that was going to jump out and attack me. As I'm trying to muster up the courage to just run for it, I see a small head of a child peek out a couple of doors down. It stayed there for a few seconds and then put its head back in the room. I immediately called out to the child, but no answer. The fear I had a minute ago was gone as I left the last room to go through the illuminated hallway. I made it to the other room in a matter of seconds, cutting on the lights and searching the entire room for the child I saw. But no one was there. I started getting spooked again as I cut off the lights in that room. Then one of the most terrifying things I'd ever seen and experienced happened. As I was leaving the room, I looked back at the last room's window which illuminated the hallway and out of nowhere, I see a massive black mass move in front of the window, almost covering the light completely. It was darker than black and its outline as it covered the light seemed to be moving. It was enough to scare me to run for my life. I ran through the rest of the hallway and down the stairs. I was stopped by one of the ushers who told me not to run, but when I told him what I saw... He looked at me as if I was crazy. Once church was over, I told my parents about what happened on the ride home and they ended up not believing me since they're skeptics. But I know what I saw that day and it's something that still scares me to this very day. In 1999, I moved back to Washington State from traveling around the country for four years. My grandmother let me move in with her for a while so I could get back on my feet again. I hated the basement of her house, always have, but it was rent-free and she was cool with Chuck, my 90-pound black lab. Plus, my grandma and I got along pretty well. Late one night and about three months in, I woke up because Chuck was moving around on the bed and he kept shaking the mattress. Then I heard him start grumping. You know those grumpy groans old dogs make when you scratch behind their ears and they love it? He started doing that. Once I realized what I was hearing, I sat up to yell at him to go back to sleep. That's when I discovered the reason he was moving around so much. He was trying to get closer to the woman standing right next to my bed, scratching him behind the ear. I didn't scream, and I'm proud of that. But also, what in God's name, where did she come from? Who was she? Why was she standing in my room petting my dog at 3am? All these questions I had in my head I was too scared to ask. I did the only thing I knew how to do in these situations. I hid under my blanket. Certainly she would be gone by the time I re-emerged from under the blanket. That's how these things are supposed to work, right? I waited for a little while, but... When I came out from under the blanket, she was still there, so I hid under the blanket again, three more times. Every time I came back out, she'd still be there, smiling at me and scratching my dog's ear. 
The last time I was under the covers, I realized that I wasn't actually afraid of the woman. Chuck and I met under stressful situations for both of us, and because of that, he and I had a super strong bond. I trusted him implicitly. If she'd meant me harm, he would have reacted to her negatively. His reaction was clearly positive, so I figured that she probably wasn't there to kill me. So I came out from under the blanket one last time, intending to deal with the freaky woman still standing right next to my bed. Somehow I decided that turning on the light would make her disappear. I reached over and snapped the bedside lamp on. I don't know why I thought that would work. Is that even a thing? Are ghosts supposed to disappear in the light? Well, I turned on the light and she didn't, so I don't think that's a thing. By then, she'd been standing at my bedside, petting Chuck for several minutes, and I was out of ghost-busting options, so I gave up on being terrified and just looked at her. Really looked at her. I can still see her right now in my mind, dressed up in a classy brown pantsuit with a cream-colored blouse. She had shoulder-length auburn hair, styled beautifully with these big, loopy curls. She looked like she'd been on her way to a work party, and she only stopped by for a second to say hello. She was very pretty, and she looked happy. I didn't have the nerve to talk to her, or at least I don't remember speaking, but I stayed present and we looked at each other for a while. I remember having the distinct impression of her knowing I was there, of both of us being aware of the other. Then she stopped petting Chuck and walked to the end of my bed, stood up straight and proud, and dissolved away. I mean that very literally. First her clothes then her skin, organs, and bones. Like that guy at the end of Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. I remember what her blood looked like as it dissolved away to reveal her skeleton. That should be a gross and terrifying memory, but I don't remember it like that. At the time, it felt like she was doing it on purpose, like she'd wanted to leave with the most dramatic exit she could manage. I remember thinking, this should scare the pants off of me, but also, wow. Somehow, I got back to sleep. And in the morning, over coffee, I was going to tell my grandmother about what happened, but she just received an upsetting phone call. Apparently, her best friend from high school, Ursula, had passed away in the middle of the night. I'd heard stories about their teenage shenanigans, especially the one about the stolen birthday cake, but I never saw a picture of Ursula, so I asked what she looked like. Well, I couldn't tell you what she looked like these days, but... When we were young, she had the most beautiful, curly auburn hair. That's not the only weird thing that happened in my grandmother's basement, but it remains the most vivid and the least scary. Many of us encounter someone who just grabs our attention in a way that we can't explain. Like they know you from this or a previous life. I come from a long line of people who encountered ghosts, but I myself don't encounter the supernatural that much. I have in the past, but not often. Tonight, I know I did. This is not fake or made up. Our town is near a beach and every 4th of July we go see the fireworks over the water. This year was no exception. Me and my wife arrived and set up chairs, settled in the sand and chilled out waiting for darkness to fall and the fireworks to start. A slight breeze, a perfect beautiful evening. About 20 minutes after we settled I smelled a waft of what I can only describe as decayed roses on the breeze, like flowers in a vase that should have been thrown out a few days ago. It wasn't a bad smell but just like sweet roses that weren't fresh. And then I saw her. From behind walked a young woman in jean shorts, t-shirt, and ball cap. She looked about 25 and had light brown wavy hair coming down about halfway on her back. I was immediately struck by her presence. Not because she was beautiful. I mean, she wasn't ugly. She was pretty, and she looked a bit off, though. Her face especially looked pretty, but weird, I suppose. Like her features didn't line up right or something. She stopped about 15 feet ahead of us and turned around. 
She looked right at me and smiled and sat down in the sand. Again, she really did look off. Something was amiss. But I was enchanted by this young woman. I looked at my wife to see what she thought but got zero reaction, like she didn't even see her. I smelled the decayed roses on the wind again. This young woman in jean shorts and ball caps sat down, took off her flip-flops and looked to the sky. She was sitting perpendicular to us but facing away. When I thought about it more, two things struck me as very, very odd. She had no electronics, no cell phone, everyone on the beach was taking selfies and playing with their phones, even the elderly. This young woman had no visible phone, no electronics, also her clothes looked straight out of the 1970s. I grew up in the 1970s, so I know what normal people looked like back then, and she had that 70s look. Totally down to the tomboy jeans and really just everything about her. She seemed very content just sitting there looking at the sky and not worried about cell phones or beach chairs or anything. Again, I smelled sweet, decaying roses on the wind. I took a picture of the whole scene on my cell phone, the pretty sky, the beach, and the strange woman. Shortly after, she got up and walked away behind us. I looked around to see where she went, but she disappeared. She was gone. When I got home and looked at the picture, I actually was not surprised to see she didn't appear in it. You might think I would have freaked out, but at some spiritual level, I really didn't expect her image to show up. Just a green orb appeared where she was sitting in the sand. I'm calm about it because I could tell she meant no harm. I really believe she was a person who passed away back in the 70s and she was just checking in on me for some reason. I'm racking my brain to try and remember if I knew a young woman who passed away when I was a child back then. I just can't put it together right now. We moved into a house in Northamptonshire a few years ago and instantly felt something was odd with the house. That feeling when someone is watching you, cold drafts. My husband started feeling compelled to say things. He'd tell me what I'd done during the day with eerie detail. He'd tell me about a girl who talked to him, but in his head. Things started going missing or would be moved to random places. One day he said, Gungoozler out of the blue. I've never heard that word, and nor has he. I just assumed it was another one of his made-up words, but it turned out it's a word meaning someone who's enjoy watching canals. There are a lot of canals in the area and one in the village. When I asked why he said that word, he told me the girl had said it to him and she loved the canal. The weirdest thing that happened, though, was one evening when both my husband and our daughter wanted to shower. They decided hubby would go first, but... As we sat in our bedroom, we heard the bathroom door close. The light goes on and the shower starts, so we assumed our daughter must have just beaten him to it. The shower ran for 45 minutes and just as we're going to check and make sure she's okay, we heard the shower stop and her come out of the bathroom and go downstairs. The light was left on. My husband turned off the light and followed her downstairs and watched her go into her bedroom, which was downstairs. As he walked into the kitchen, though, our daughter walked back in the door. When he asked her how she'd gotten dressed and out so quickly, she told him she'd been out for the last hour seeing to her horses. So, who was in the shower? He saw a girl again a few weeks later, also stood in our daughter's doorway. Lots of other strange things happened there, but never anything scary, just freaky. Anyway, we moved a couple of years ago and nothing has happened since. Until this weekend. We went away to a hotel in Cornwall. On the first night, it was very foggy and cold. As we stood outside having a cig, he suddenly said, Joan, Joan is waiting in the summer house. I asked what on earth he was talking about. He had a strange look in his face and just said, Joan is waiting in the summer house for Derek. Then he sort of snapped out of it mouth hanging open and said 
I have no idea where that came from. We talked about it and he said he felt compelled to say those things. He also felt she was military. We carried on discussing it for a while, then mid-sentence he said, He's married and she's waiting in the summer house. A bit spooked, we decided to go back to our room. We searched on the internet and found out that in 1946, a young woman who was serving in the Navy was stationed at the hotel. Her name was Joan. She was having an affair with a married officer. When they were found out, she was transferred to another site in Devon. On the night she was due to move, she was waiting for him in the summer house where he shot her twice in the head. His name was William. We were totally freaked out. The man's name was wrong, but at that time, people used to be known by other names frequently, i.e. my granddad was John, but called Jack. My grandma was Grace, but called Queenie. Perhaps he was really known as Derek. I've always been interested in the paranormal and witnessed and experienced some events that I can't explain to this day, but I'm a very rational person, so I always brushed it off, while keeping an open mind, of course. But one of these experiences left me with no doubt. My current girlfriend used to work at a cafe bakery in an old building in Bordeaux. She used to close at night alone because she was the store manager and stayed after the crew was done to count the register, do all the paperwork, etc., The bakery consisted of the storefront, the kitchen in the back, and the office in the back as well. There's also a second floor which is only storage and the changing rooms for the staff. The building isn't shared, it was only the cafe bakery. She told me she felt uneasy as soon as her first shift there. Most nights she'd hear running footsteps upstairs, the TVs in the sitting area for the customers turning off and on randomly and the front door's doorbell ringing while the door was not moving. All that when she was alone. Another co-worker she was close with shared the same experiences with her. I believed her because she has a history of paranormal encounters and is very serious about that stuff, but I wasn't convinced. Until I witnessed it. I also worked in the food industry, so I was rarely off when she was working too. One Sunday I was off, so I decided to come pick her up, and spent the last 30 to 45 minutes of her workday she usually spends alone with her this time. She gave me a tour of the place, and it did feel uneasy, but nothing significant happened, except for some rattling noises upstairs. Until I mentioned how quiet her ghost of the bakery was. She was counting the register in the office in the back of the store. I was leaning against the wall in the corridor leading to the office, my back turning away from the storefront. To my right, there was the dishwashing room. There was no door to this room, just an opening in the corridor. To better visualize, I was facing towards the office watching my girlfriend, turning my back to the storefront, leaning against the wall, but seeing the dishwashing room in my peripheral vision. Jokingly, I tell her, I'm glad your ghost decided to leave us alone tonight. Not one second after I finish my sentence, the pile of glasses and dishes in the dishwashing room go flying. I saw the whole room clearly in my side vision, and there was no one or nothing that could have done that. There was a pile of glasses stacked up in a pyramid, and they flew as if someone ran their hand through the base. It wasn't one glass tripping and bringing down the pyramid. It was legitimately pushed off. She just told me, I told you he's always there. Since she's used to stuff like that happening, she was almost done, so we stayed less than ten minutes in there, but... I could feel a different level of oppression and uneasiness for the whole time. This one sticks with me because there's no rational explanation. I saw the dishes go flying around, and it was a direct response to my joke. I have no other experiences that could be explained. I'd be happy to post them if you want to find an explanation or lack of with me. Driving through a ghost on a pitch black forest road, seeing a school kid ghost sat on my bed at night cats behaving weirdly. 
I've had a lot of paranormal stuff, but the one I just told is just outright the weirdest. I'm a moderately typical teenager from Japan. I'm male, and ever since I can remember, I have throughout my lifetime had recurring encounters with some strange people, be it in terms of looks or behavior. These encounters can happen anywhere from a week's space to several months, and it always seems like when I do, it was their intention to meet me. My most recent one was on my way home from school. During my walk, I was looking down at my phone for a short moment, about to text one of my friends that I had planned to have over at my house later. As I looked up, a young man looking like he was in his 20s was approaching me a few meters ahead. This confused me for a minute as it was a straight and fairly long path ahead. I thought to myself that while I may have been looking at my phone, I would surely have noticed him coming from the corner of the path a good length away or at least I expected him to be closer to that corner. But there he was, approaching from the middle as if he had appeared from thin air. His hair was dark brown, a bit unkempt but still good looking, and he had green eyes. His clothes were fairly ordinary too, keeping a sort of laid-back summer style to it. The most remarkable thing about him was his tattoo, or mark per se, a black line running from his left chin and down underneath his shirt. As he got closer enough for conversation, he stopped me and asked for my name. When I told him, he said that he heard about me before. This confused me as I'm not exactly a celebrity, but I thought nothing more of it. We then had some boring small talk, but he genuinely seemed pretty cheerful. Just as he was about to take off, he told me that I should probably wait for my friend. He didn't give me much of a chance to respond to this before walking off in the direction he came from. I thought about what he'd said and turned around to walk back to school. I glanced behind my back not long after, only to find that he was nowhere to be seen. As I made it back to my school, I sure enough find my friend waiting by the gate. She apparently thought that we were going to walk to my place together and had been waiting for me for quite a long time. I apologized and we began walking and, well, that's the end of it. I didn't tell her about the encounter, but... I thought about it when she left. I didn't tell him or hint about my friend at all, so how would he have known? These types of encounters have kept on happening throughout my whole life, sometimes very frequently, and I don't know why. These people I meet just seem too unreal, and usually know something I never told them about, which leads me to believe that maybe these people aren't human after all. I'm a 30-year-old female and had just woken up and was getting ready for the day in our bathroom, which is attached to our bedroom. If you look through the door, you have a full view of our bed and my sleeping five-year-old son. I saw something adult-sized move past the door in the dark bedroom at regular walking speed, so I opened the door a bit and looked out. There was no one there and my kid was snoring. My husband should have been at work for two hours by this point. I checked our security cameras and saw nothing but my husband leaving for work earlier, and I chalked it up to my anxiety, sleep deprivation, as I'm heavily pregnant and can't sleep for anything right now. A few minutes later, I heard what sounded like an adult man humming, but it only lasted a few seconds. Can't name the tune, though. I couldn't tell where it was coming from as we slept with the box fan on full blast right outside the door, and I had the exhaust fan on at the time. I looked out of the bathroom door again, nothing. Am I going crazy, I thought. I took a deep breath and continued washing my face. 
The door was open about two to three inches and the mirror in our tiny bathroom is one that covers most of the wall, from the counter to almost the ceiling. It's big and you can see everything behind you and around you. The door is to my left right behind me. You could reach it and tap my shoulder. Out of the corner of my eye through the mirror I suddenly saw something that wasn't there before. There was a hand reaching through the opening of the door gripping the door frame right behind me. It looked like a grown man's hand and was at eye level. I froze, then turned around half expecting my husband to be playing a prank, because who else would be in here with me? The hand was gone. I even checked through the mirror. Instantly my child screamed, Mama, as loud as they could and I jerked the door open. Nothing there but a scared kid's eyes wide open. He wasn't looking at me. Who was that? Who, baby? I was trying not to sound scared. He stared off into space for a few seconds, then seemingly forgot about whatever just happened. Mama, why did you say my name? I didn't, baby. Did you hear your name? You said my name real loud, and then you weren't beside me. I was in the bathroom. I don't think I did, buddy. It sounded like you. I checked the cameras. I checked the windows and doors. Every room and closet shaking the whole time. Nothing. I feel safer living in this apartment than I ever have anywhere else. Even alone and I have bad anxiety. Like I said, if it was only one of us I would have shrugged it off as sleep deprivation or night terrors, which my kid has never had, or something rational. But I'm asking all of you, what did we see and hear? This was in 2014 or 15. My girlfriend and I were staying in a hotel called Stay on Main. I only learned later about the hotel's history. I only stayed there because it was cheap. That place was incredibly freaky, but anyway, I digress. My girlfriend and I were walking to a parking structure where our car was because we planned on going to Disneyland. As we were walking there, my girlfriend noticed a shortcut to the car down an alley. My instincts told me no. Let's just walk around since it's a nice day outside anyway. She insisted and I said screw it, let's go. As soon as we turned into the alley I noticed right away that a man in a hoodie quickly turned and followed us down the alley as soon as we went. I told my girlfriend under my breath, don't freak out but we're being followed. I told her to run and get help while I fight him off. As we started to pick up our pace to create some distance from him, I noticed that this alley is a dead end. There's no way out but to go back from where we came. This man was closing his distance on us, had his hands in his hoodie pocket by the belly. I make a fist with my keys as I turn around to face him ready to fight as we pass a dumpster. I swear to God, guys, two men in perfect business suits with briefcases say good morning and pass us walking very fast. They popped up out of nowhere. They had black sunglasses on, were white and tall at least six feet tall. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't give them the greeting of the day back. I was just in shock. This man that was following us had turned around and sprinted out of the alleyway, which really showed me his true intentions. My girlfriend and I followed the two suited men out of the alley back to the public streets. Hoodie guy was nowhere to be seen, but then we somehow lost the two men in suits. I swear to God they saved my life and my girlfriend's my now wife. I'm convinced that they were angels who protected us from a potential tragedy. I still give my wife guff till this day about taking that shortcut through the alley. I 
was seven years old and at a funeral, my grandfather's to be exact. I saw a strange man hanging out in the back of the funeral home just watching everyone. He had a very distinct black suit with a nice pair of polished brown shoes and curly red hair. At one point I was back there near him, sitting on a pew, and he told me he knew my grandfather very well and couldn't wait to see him again. I remember he had a sort of pale look to him like he was sick or something. Could have been the lighting, however. I told him something along the lines of me too and that I really missed him. I can't remember, I was pretty young at that point. It was weird because this man couldn't have been older than 40 and my grandfather was 90 when he died. He patted me on the shoulder then turned and walked into the hall of the funeral home. I remember his hands were ice cold as his pinky grazed my neck as he patted me. I told my grandma and mom about him and when we got home, she whipped out the photo album and asked if I could point the man out. There was an old grainy photo from the wedding day and there he was in the same suit and everything. It turns out that man was my grandfather's father who had died 45 years earlier. I never saw him again and I get chills thinking about it to this day. I never saw him before in a picture or anything and my grandma Lorraine nearly fainted when I pointed out the man who had talked to me. She was the only one who believed me and to this day my parents think that I was playing a joke. So where I live in London, there's this outdoor exercise park I like to frequent as part of my workout routine. I'm sure most of you know the kind I'm talking about, the kind that's paid for with public money and is mostly just painted metal frames consisting of pull-up bars and the like. Between that exercise park and the free weights I have at home, I think I've saved myself a few hundred quid in gym membership fees. I used to love the place and it provided a real sense of community. That might sound crazy coming from a Londoner, but the stereotype of us all being cold and aloof with each other is a bit of a myth, to be honest. But I hadn't even been near that little corner of Kensington in almost two years now, and honestly, I don't want to lay eyes on that place ever again. And I'll tell you why. So I'm hanging off one of the pull-up bars one day, trying to get that one extra rep on my set when I hear what I can only describe as a blood-curdling scream. I know that might sound sort of melodramatic, but those of you that have heard the scream of a person that's actually in fear for their life will know exactly what I'm talking about. It's a sound that elicits a physical reaction in you, like your brain takes over and says, time to go, pumps you full of adrenaline, and triggers that fight or flight response that I know a lot of you will be familiar with. In my case, I was feeling a little bolder than usual, thanks to testosterone, so I made the split-second decision to run towards the sound of the screaming. I jogged out of the park in the direction I'd heard the scream, just in time to see two people sprinting in the same direction. It was quite obviously a smaller woman being chased by a larger man, and with it being later on at night and in the middle of lockdown, I figured that no one else would be coming to help her. It was down to me and me alone. So I ran. I sprinted after the pair of them shouting something to the effect of, Oi, leave her alone. The chaser was wearing a hoodie and a baseball cap, and and I remember the silhouette of him clear as he looked around for a moment, saw me, then carried on chasing the girl. I remember that scaring the bejesus out of me, thinking that he didn't care if he'd been clocked or not, he was going to keep chasing that girl, didn't care if there was witnesses. I was honestly hoping that just me intervening would scare him off, so the prospect of dealing with such a psycho who was undeterred by imminent intervention, Christ, that put the fear of God into me. But what else could I do? Just turn around and walk away? I wouldn't have been able to live with myself, so like I said, I ran after them. And as I ran, I watched them turn down a dead end street. I'm not sure if either of them knew it was a dead end, but I did. So as I followed them down it, I knew that whatever confrontation was about to occur, 
it was going to happen right then. But as I turned the corner and got ready to bark my head off while kicking the guy's head in, I was greeted with the single most confusing and unnerving sight of my adult life. There was no one there. The only thing I could see was this dead-end street, some overflowing wheelie bins at the end of it, and some creepy-looking black street art depicting two human shapes. They were just shapes, no faces, no clothes, the kind of thing a kid would have just sprayed there in about ten seconds. They were just stood there, still as statues, like they were staring right back at me. I'd never had a panic attack before, and I didn't even know what one felt like, so the fact that my vision went all cloudy and I suddenly found it hard to breathe, it was terrifying. It was only when I calmed down a bit and I thought to actually call the police. I mean, just because I'd lost them didn't mean it hadn't been happening or whatever. So, I called 999, told the operator what I'd seen, then went back to my flat to get a shower and some food. I thought I might calm down after that. I mean, you can understand why I'd been shaken up after something like that, right? I'd left my details with the police dispatcher, as I obviously wanted to be of more help if I could. They did actually end up phoning me back too, at least a uniform officer called me back, but it wasn't to collect a statement or to ask me any more questions. I won't bore you with the nitty gritty of the phone call, I'd rather not rehash every word and I'm sure you'll understand why. The officers started off by confirming a few details, location, number of people being chased, number of people chasing and that sort of thing. It all sounded totally routine at first, but then things took a more sinister turn. I was basically told in no uncertain terms that wasting police time was seen as a very serious offense. Not only that, but I was basically threatened with violating the newly instituted Coronavirus Act of 2020. I responded by telling the officer I was 100% serious about what I'd seen, that I wasn't wasting their time, and that I'd been partaking in my allotted daily exercise time. In response, the officer basically told me to pull the other one. He told me that he and a colleague had reviewed some CCTV footage from the area, footage which showed nothing more than a lone man running down a street before turning a blind corner. Basically, they told me I had been chasing nothing but shadows, and if I made another false report like that, he'd personally make sure I was charged for both wasting police time and violating the COVID Act. I was speechless, and after the officer told me that I was entitled to make a complaint about it, in the smartiest way possible, he hung up. I was in a state of complete shock. It all seemed like a sick joke, one that I definitely didn't find amusing. I remember sitting down on my bed, on the verge of another panic attack, only that time, I'd actually found out what they were, and I knew how to deal with them. I wrapped a plastic bag around my mouth and nose and cycled my air until I felt kind of a woozy calm descend over me. Then... Once I felt relatively normal, I called my mum back in Sheffield. I know it sounds a bit pathetic, a bloke in his early 30s running to mummy when he was upset, but I honestly didn't know who else to turn to at that point. I felt like I was going insane. I told her everything, absolutely everything, down to the last detail, and when I was done, mum said something that had me on the verge of tears. I remember what it was, word for word, and I don't think I'll ever forget. Dean. I'm your mom. I love you. And I'll always love you. But son, I think you need to get some help. She launched into this big speech about how lockdown and self-isolation had really taken their toll on people over the previous few months, and they may be I was just having some kind of stress reaction to the whole pandemic thing. This was late spring of 2022, back when people were really scared. Not just vulnerable people or those with vulnerable relatives, I mean... Everyone was really freaked out by this killer disease that had seemingly sprang up from nowhere. I'd already admitted to having panic attacks. Well, only one, but one was enough to have my mom really thinking that there was something wrong. I knew she was concerned, but she told me as much, but I didn't expect her to do what she did next, even if it was purely out of love and concern. A few days later, I got a call from a doctor and almost instantly I knew what the deal was. It was a psychiatrist, and to his credit, he was completely honest about his reasons for calling. 
He said it wasn't an emergency, just that my mom had been in contact with him and would I be interested in having a few over the phone counseling sessions to help with the stress of social distancing. It brought on mixed emotions. On one hand, my mom was so concerned with my well-being that she'd sought out medical health assistance for me. It was purely an act of motherly love. But on the other hand, the one person I needed to believe me thought I was going bonkers, so much so that she'd contacted someone who could actually contribute to me being sectioned under the Mental Health Act. There was only one thing that I was sure of in that moment, and that was that I hadn't imagined anything. Like I said, I had a physical reaction to that scream. I'd seen the guy chasing the girl. I could remember the sound her hard bottom shoes made as they hit the pavement. I could remember the sight of the guy's baseball capped head spinning to clock me before I gave chase. I hadn't bloody imagined anything. It was real. It was all real. But then again, I was now faced with something of a dilemma. Either I keep talking about how I had apparently chased two pieces of street art down an alleyway and face getting sectioned, or just admit that it was all just a manifestation of stress and take a prescription of Zopclone or whatever it was the doctor wanted to give me. On the one hand, I wanted to fight my corner. I hadn't lied and I wasn't going crazy. But on the other, I didn't want to worry my mom any further and I didn't want to lose my job. The company I worked for basically said that anyone that couldn't or wouldn't work from home was surplus to requirements and would have their weekly hours reduced to zero. So I did what I thought was best for my mom and what was best for me in the long run. I rang the doctor back, told them I was just stressed out and accepted their recommendation of Zopiclone prescription. At this point I should make it clear that Zopiclone is pretty much just a sleep aid there are no antipsychotic effects, none that were obvious to me anyways. I took one of the pills one night and after that I never touched the pack again. After that I just learned to let the whole thing go. I know that it all sounds preposterous, given how indignant I might have seemed in writing this, but sometimes, and I'm sure some of you will be able to relate to this, sometimes it's better to take what's called the path of least resistance. Some people want a resolution, a grand conclusion. To be able to draw a line under an experience and say, that's that, done and dusted, or I understand now, I get it. But there's a lot to be said for the power of just forgetting about something. I know that seems rich coming from me, typing up some big essay after almost two years of trying to forget, but trust me, it's something I wish every single day that I could do. I feel like a moth dancing around a burning candle, wanting nothing more for the flame to be suddenly and finally extinguished. I used to live in Port St. Lucie down here in Florida, and being something of a gun nut, I'd make weekly visits to a place called the OK Corral Gun Club over in Okeechobee. For a long time, the OKGC OK was just about my favorite place in the world. You could shoot off a few rounds, then head over to the club's restaurant for what I swear is the best turkey club I've ever tasted. Some of my fondest memories are from the OKCG, OK and since I took clients there on occasion to close deals, I'd like to think my membership fee paid for itself. But that membership ended on November 17th of 2017, when it was revoked by the club over an accident that occurred on one of the rifle ranges. It was an accident that I've never been able to fully explain, and one that almost ended one of the most enduring friendships of my life. Myself and Roger, my supposed victim in the story, arrived at the OK just after 8 in the morning. Definitely not our usual time, but since I had to take my kid to a little league game later that morning, it was just about the only slot that we could fit a shoot in. I packed my custom M1, a World War II classic, with a modern twist that I'm still very much in love with. I had the metal parts parkerized with manganese phosphate, meaning you'd need a diamond cutter to put a scratch in it, and with a walnut handguard that I had fitted, 
It really is a thing of beauty. I also had the muzzle recrowned and the front and rear sights replaced with national match standard parts. The result was that I could shoot the butt off of a fly at 300 yards. I mean, any pro shooter in the country would have been happy to use that rifle. And I haven't touched it in just over four years now. And that's because it's the rifle that almost killed my best friend. I remember it was kind of chilly that morning. Well, about as chilly as you're ever likely to get in Central Florida. Me and Roger get ourselves some takeout coffee from the club's cafe, shoulder our gear, then headed down to one of the ranges. After that, we started off our usual ritual of blowing off steam in more ways than one. We'd complain about our wives, our kids, and our clients, and each bullet was like a little piece of tension just flying down range. I swear sometimes we'd leave with this zen feeling of absolute calm, having unloaded both our consciences and our mags in one sitting. But that time, when it came to my third or fourth mag, something weird started to happen. It started with one missed shot, then two, then three. And remember, this is with one of the most accurate rifles on the planet. Roger shouted over to me, saying something like, They say the eyes are the first to go in old age, but... Jesus, dude, you're shooting like a drunk stormtrooper this morning. I didn't even give him so much as a grunt in response. I was way too concentrated with identifying whatever was wrong with my beloved custom. So, as you can imagine, I started troubleshooting. I cleared the chamber, checked the ammo I was using, working my way through a little mental checklist when all of a sudden I hear, What the hell? I look up and... Roger is staring at something downrange. Then he starts moving his neck back and forth, you know, like a person does when they're trying to look at something from a slightly different angle. Then, before I can ask him what's given him the willies, he does something that you should never, ever do at a gun club. He starts walking downrange, towards the targets. The rifle range had about 20 lanes on it back then, even more now, so I heard. And since it was so early in the morning on a weekend, there was only one other lane in use by a single other shooter. When Roger started to walk down range, I look over to the other shooter who's in a similar state of shock as I was. I remember hissing something like, What's wrong with you, man? But he didn't even look back for a second. I tried for a second time to see what he was so transfixed by and then I saw it, or rather, I caught a little glimpse of them. It was only when the sun broke from behind a cloud, casting a few rays of late fall sun onto something that glinted in the light. It was only then that I had a better idea of what I was looking at. I just had to wait for Roger to confirm it. As he got closer and closer, I called out to him, asking if he was looking at what I thought he was looking at. When he replied, I started to walk down range too, just to make sure I wasn't going totally crazy. But lo and behold, Hanging there in midair like they were stuck in some invisible wall were three of my 30 6 I remember stopping dead in my tracks before instinctively backing away from them a few steps. I've never felt that kind of fear before. The kind when you're looking at something that just does not compute. Meanwhile, Roger is still just staring at the bullets, eyes all wide, mouth slightly opening and closing like a fish out of water. He was trying to find the words and was failing every time. Even though we were in a complete state of shock, completely absorbed by the raw curiosity of what we were seeing, at no point did Roger step in front of the floating bullets. I guess once you've got that muscle memory gun safety drilled into you, even something as sane like that can't make you neglect it. And that's the thing I had a hard time explaining to folks afterwards. Stuff already didn't make sense. But what happened next was somehow even more bizarre and terrifying than the floating bullets. When I finally got my train of thought back, the first thing that occurred to me was to take a picture of what we were looking at. I knew none of them would believe me, I mean, people still don't, and if I'd managed to get that picture then it would have saved a mountain of trouble afterwards. But right as I got my phone out, I heard this faint, almost tinny noise like the sound you hear after you hear a loud bang or whatever. I look up, and I swear to God, the bullets were vibrating. Not a lot, but 
they were definitely trembling very subtly in midair. I took another few steps back, not sure of exactly what was going to happen, but knowing enough to know it wouldn't be good. Roger did the same, turning a whiter shade of pale as he moved to his left to get even further away from the bullets. I have to make this clear for a third time now because at no point did he stand in front of the rounds. He remained, as I was looking at it, to the right of the bullets, facing me and them the whole time. Then right as the tinny noise reached its peak, I heard this supersonic crack, and the bullets were gone. I remember looking over at Roger like, Oh my god, did you see that? Roger just looked at me, same wide eyes as before, then puts a hand to his shoulder. When he brought it away, there was blood on his fingers, and that's when he collapsed. I guess you can all figure what happened next. There was screaming, shouting, 911 was called. Roger was rushed to the ER, and as a precaution, I was detained by the cops. I was worried, sure. I mean, I had never even been arrested before, let alone for shooting someone. But all it took was Roger insisting that he didn't want to press charges, how it had all been a horrible accident, and I was released. That all changed once Roger told the cops what happened. They got into their heads that something was going on, as in, I must have intimidated him into coming up with some crazy story to distract from the fact that I shot him. Somehow, it didn't matter that he walked down range. In fact, it was probably me that forced Roger to walk down there in the first place. After all, once Roger's, now ex-wife, got in his head that that's when the real trouble came. She convinced him that all the floating bullet stuff couldn't have possibly have happened, but the only logical thing was that his best friend in the world had just up and shot him for no good reason whatsoever. Didn't matter that he'd seen all the same stuff as me. Didn't matter that he wasn't even standing in the path of the bullets. All that mattered was that someone had to take the blame, and for a long time, that person was me. Like I said, it was all that stuff that almost ended our friendship. I know he was a mess around that time, emotionally and physically, and we've since put all that behind us. But as X got all up in his head, told him what he saw was impossible, that it was all his way of rationalizing that his best bud had tried to murder him. It took until the cops got their hands on the security camera footage, thank God for that, for them to actually drop the case against me. I mean, they knew something had happened, something real messed up, but it wasn't anything they could charge me for, especially since it was clear that Roger had walked down the range of his own volition. After that, it was just a case of me and Roger patching things up. I'd rather not go into the whole divorce thing he went through, it was pretty upsetting for everyone involved and I don't really feel like it's my story to tell. But needless to say, we had a pretty emotional reunion not long after he filed the papers. We're still close, real close. The kind of close you can only really get when you go through something truly terrifying. I know there's a scientific explanation for what happened to us that day. There has to be. I just think it's one that science hasn't quite reached yet. Maybe there will come a time when all sorts of things are easily explained through science, or metaphysics as Roger has taken to calling it. It's just a shame it's not now, because, let me tell you, it would have saved me and my best friend a whole world of trouble. I was born and raised in the Catholic Church. I believe in God, I believe in the devil, I believe in good and evil. I believe in an essential order to the universe, one that can be occasionally cruel, but one that makes sense in the grand scheme of things. I am also an amateur astronomer. Some people say those two things don't really go together, that no matter how much I search for the heavens, I'll only ever be looking at the stars. But to me, that's besides the point. I don't believe that my faith precludes me from appreciating some of God's finer works. 
and believe it or not, there's no denying that the night sky is one of the Lord's more incredible creations. That being said, I once witnessed something that, to me, made absolutely zero sense. It didn't shake my faith, and in fact I feel like it's even stronger as a result, and it's something that neither myself nor anyone else has ever been able to successfully explain. So imagine you're me for a second. You got your telescope set up in your backyard, you have a hot cocoa on hand. It's one of those perfect, silent, cloudless winter nights, one almost tailor-made for amateur astronomers such as yourself. You're checking off your favorite constellations, nodding hello to the bovine face of Hyades, counting all four of Jupiter's bright Galilean moons, when suddenly your lens goes black. At first you kind of jump back from the telescope because your lens only normally goes dark like if something is in the way of the scope. You're relieved to see that no one's there, as a strange person slightly manifesting in front of your scope in the middle of the night would be a whole mess of trouble. But then you're kind of worried because your $3,000 telescope is out of warranty and you can't exactly take those things down to Walmart to get them repaired. But then, something compels you to look up and that's when you realize that the entire night sky, moon and all, has gone completely dark. At first, I know this might sound like a terrible cliche, but I actually thought I was either dreaming or seeing things. I remember blinking, hard, the way you do when you're dreaming as a kid and you're trying to wake yourself up from a bad dream. But when I opened my eyes and looked at the sky again, I realized I wasn't just imagining the whole thing. The sky had gone from its regular celestial glory to a ceiling painted matte black. Suddenly, I realized I must have been witnessing a once-in-a-lifetime astronomical event, a kind of celestial eclipse, the likes of which would be talked about and dissected for generations to come. I felt the hairs on the back of my neck standing up while this great electric tingle went through me. I thought about trying to capture the event on my phone and as much as I wanted to, I found that I just couldn't move. It was pure hesitation, half of thinking, It'll just be a blank, black picture. And then I figured I could make a video of the stars flickering back on, but that's when a very, very frightening series of thoughts occurred to me. The first being, what if they don't flicker back on? What if it's not some kind of mass, heavy cloud cover? And what if it was? Surely I'd be able to see the ambient light from the moon lighting up the clouds. And that's when this feeling of intense panic started to rise up inside me. I appreciate this might sound a little melodramatic, but I began to wonder if I was witnessing something less wondrous and more apocalyptic. As those thoughts and feelings began to take hold, I was suddenly gripped by the desire to run back into my house and wake my wife. I didn't know what was about to happen, but whatever it was, if it was bad, I didn't want her to be taken by surprise by it. And as I tried to move, I couldn't unglue my gaze from the darkened skies above. And that's when I saw it. I can only describe it as the entire sky shifting, like I was looking at nothing but a jet black canopy that suddenly and violently shifted before my eyes. I know that sounds illogical. Like, how could I know it was moving if there was nothing but pitched black up there? But trust me, my brain registered the movement, so much so that I felt almost dizzy from it. It was like a black wing moved over the earth, and right as it passed over us, I saw the heavens light up again. Every single star in the sky, including the moon, flickered back to life in an instant, and that feeling of vertigo hit me even harder than before. I stumbled backwards, falling on my butt like a toddler who was still learning to walk. Then once I'd picked myself up, a singular thought occurred to me. Check the internet. Check the news. I remember running to my desktop, bringing up a browser window, then checking every single news website I could think of. I expected to see headlines consisting of things like, Breaking News, Starlight Blackout Shakes America, or What Just Happened in the Skies Over North America. But there was nothing. Just ads for blackout curtains, or Cora questions about when the sun is going to burn out. In frustration, I called an astronomer friend of mine that lived up in Maine, and... As soon as he answered the phone, 
I knew he'd be no help. He sounded groggy, like I'd just woken him up. And as it turned out, that was exactly the case. Just in case, I asked him if he'd been watching the skies over the past hour or so, but it was no surprise when he said no. He must have been able to hear the tension in my voice, however, because he quickly started asking what was wrong. And that's when I launched into this long diatribe regarding what I'd just seen. Admittedly, I was a mess of what I'd seen, my ideas on it, the prospect of it being a world-shaking event. It shouldn't have surprised me that he'd interrupt to tell me, Steve, call me back in the morning, man, I'm too tired for this right now. But it did. It hurt a little, having such a close friend and fellow astronomer disbelieve me, but at the same time, I understood why he was so skeptical. I suppose that was what the likes of Galileo felt, discovering the world was round but having everyone think he was nuts. I checked the news again in the morning, found nothing, then immediately called my friend up in Maine. I told him the same story down to the last detail, but when I was done, he said something that nailed shut the coffin lid of my story. Steve, I think you should go see a doctor. That was the last time I told anyone what I'd experienced. Even my wife doesn't know what happened to me that night. I still search online from time to time, looking for any trace of newspaper articles, historical accounts, or eyewitness reports of what I'd come to call the blackout. But still, there was nothing. No matter how hard I looked, there was no historical accounts which matched up to what I'd seen that night. Eventually, I just dropped it and I tried to get on with my life without dangerously obsessing over the blackout. I didn't want to think that I was crazy, and I did take my friend's words to heart. I kept on sky gazing but told myself that any repeated incidents and I'd go straight to a doctor to tell them what I was experiencing. But it didn't happen again. It's never happened again. And I feel like if it had, for anyone, anywhere in the world, they'd have posted about it online by now. I suppose I should have done the same a long time ago, created a kind of marker stone for anyone who might experience or witness the same thing, but I didn't, and that's what I suppose I'm trying to correct in typing this all up. I still don't know what happened that night. I still don't know what I was looking at or what moved across the sky that practically knocked me on my butt. But I think the only thing that stopped me going crazy is the strength of my faith in God. I think I saw the hand of my creator that night, or at least that's what I choose to believe because the alternative, any alternative, is almost too terrifying to consider. A few years back in my early 20s, I lived for distance running. It was something I kind of fell into as a way of losing what my mom affectionately referred to as puppy fat and at first, I hated it with a passion. But after I started to see results, I kept at it until eventually, I think I was straight up addicted to what's called runner's high. After that, I signed up to my first race. It was just a little 5k fun run and I didn't even place top 10. but. After that, it was part of my personality. I was that runner girl in my family, as well as my circle of friends. I must have spent just shy of a thousand pounds on specialist running shoes, ankle tape, knee supports, nipple tape, you name it. Running was something I'd be doing until I didn't have the breath in my lungs to carry me anymore. So would you believe me if I told you I haven't been running in almost three years now? Personally, if you have told me in my prime that I'd just drop running one day, never to don my lycra leggings ever again, I'd have called you a liar. But then again, if you have looked into a crystal ball and told me why, I think I'd have understood. To explain why, I have to tell you the story of a girl named Vanessa Marcotti. Vanessa was born in June of 1989, on the other side of the Atlantic in the US state of Massachusetts. She went to the University of Boston, then 
went on to work for Google in New York City. From what I understand, Vanessa was happy, healthy, and successful, the daughter of two very proud parents. But in August of 2016, Vanessa went out for a run and never came back. Her body was found on a running trail in a forest not far from her home, with burns on her face, feet, and hands. Her killer had choked her to death, broken her nose, then humiliated her after he'd taken her life. He also stole her clothes, her earbuds, things like that, and he also left plenty of himself behind at the scene, if you catch my drift. According to the articles I read, Vanessa's injuries mostly came from having put up quite a lot of resistance during the attack. Her killer was so enraged by the fact that she actually hurt him back that she dared to put up a fight, that he'd beaten her and burned her. The police arrested a guy for her murder, and I'm pretty sure the trial is yet to happen because I've got a Google alert set to notify me and I've heard nothing about it so far. But that's not really why I'm telling you this story. The point is why some random murder on the other side of the world stopped me from doing something I love most in the world. You see, Vanessa was killed in her home county of Worcester, Massachusetts. I live in Worcester, England, and my name is Vanessa Marcotte. All that's different about our names is one little E. Vanessa was born in June of 1989, the exact same month and year as me, with our birthdays being less than a week apart. Vanessa's parents are named John and Rosianna, and my parents are named Ross and Jean. Vanessa had brown hair and brown eyes, and yep, you guessed it, I also have brown hair and brown eyes. You know that tired old cliche of my blood ran cold whenever a person sees something scary? It's true. It's exactly right. I remember feeling like I had ice in my veins as I read more and more about Vanessa's life and death. We were twins in more ways than one. More than twins in some ways. It was like we were the same person. I know that sounds mental and I suppose to some of you it might sound like I'm trying to make this poor girl's murder all about me. There is such a thing as coincidences, after all. But like ten different coincidences, all in a row, you can understand why I'd be so freaked out. Only that's not what stopped me from running, not entirely. That happened almost a week later. As I've already touched on, I was freaked out by the other Vanessa's murder, but it wasn't enough to put me off running entirely. My route was open, in public, safe. But then I go out running one day and my route is almost completely empty. It ran around the edge of quite a large park with houses lining the entire route. There was always someone out there, be it a dog walker or another runner, sometimes even a sweet old couple enjoying an afternoon walk. But that time, my last time, it was completely deserted, all except for one man. He had short hair, glasses, and a dark blue anorak. That much I remember about him. I saw him looking at me as I passed him on my first loop, but that's not entirely unusual. It's not nice, but wearing skin-tight clothes draws a lot of looks from the opposite gender, even if most are trying to be discreet about it. The way he looked at me was fairly creepy, but it didn't give me much cause for alarm. However, when it came to running my second loop of the park, I just... I just couldn't do it. I know it must sound slightly crazy to the more rational of you, but I just couldn't shake the feeling that running that second loop and bumping into him again would be the end of me. I'd just end up like Vanessa, beaten, violated, mutilated. We were twins in more way than one. Our lives had been mirrored images in so many ways, I didn't want our deaths to be the same too. I gave it a week told myself I'd give myself a break then get back to running when I felt up to it again. Then, a fortnight went by and I still hadn't put my running shoes on. Then a fortnight became a month, and a month became half a year, and so on and so forth until here I am. Three years later and I've never once gone running again. These days I do a lot of burpees than skipping rope when I want to save my knees. I'm thinking about investing in an exercise bike too, at least when I have the money to afford one. Anything but running to be honest because 
Part of me knows deep down that me and Vanessa's existences are mirror images, and as long as I stay away from my once beloved jogging, I'm going to live a long, happy life. About 10 years ago now, I did a little solo hiking around Yellowstone. I was a junior in college and I barely made it through the year thanks to the amount of partying I was doing. I was determined not to mess up the final year, so I decided to completely dry out by hiking around Yellowstone for the better part of a week. It was honestly one of the most awesome experiences of my life. I learned a lot about myself while also confirming that I could still have a good time without drugs or alcohol playing a starring role. As you can imagine, given how beautiful Yellowstone can be in the summertime, I took a lot of photos. Photos of incredible views, photos of creeks and streams and ponds, and also photos of my sleeping setup. A lot of the time I just sprung up a little tarp up in the trees then stuff myself into my sleeping bag before dozing off. A few of my college buddies just didn't believe that I was doing something so out there, as I definitely wasn't the outdoorsy type before that period. Naturally, I was only too happy to prove them wrong, so whenever I set up my shelter, I'd take a few pictures before climbing into my sleeping bag and passing out. I always checked the pictures just after I took them, then took another few if I needed better angles or lighting. So, while it was there, I didn't actually check the entire camera roll on my iPhone. I figured I'd seen them all as I took them. So, when I went back home and started showing my buddies the pictures, I wasn't expecting the unexpected. But then again, when are we ever? I'm swiping through the photos, happily soaking up how impressed they were with my little adventure, when I suddenly see a picture that I don't recognize. The picture was of my sleeping setup, only instead of being taken from a few feet in front of it at ground level, it looked like it had been taken from like 50 or 60 feet up in the air. Not only that, but I could clearly see myself passed out in the sleeping bag, like the picture had been taken in the very early morning. One of my roommates says something like, Whoa dude, nice angle, did you climb up a tree or something? I didn't answer him right away. I was completely flabbergasted by what I was looking at, and that's because the place I'd been sleeping that night looked out over a wide open space. Basically, there were no trees in front of where I was sleeping, let alone any high enough to get the kind of angle the photo had been taken at. My roommate noticed my prolonged silence and asked me what the matter was. Again, I just couldn't find the words for a few seconds, and when I could finally speak again, all that came out was, I didn't take that picture. Obviously, they didn't think that there was anything amiss with that at first, so their follow-up question was, Well, who did? I thought you were alone that whole time. I just turned to them, looked them in the eyes, and just said, I was. Only then did they really start to understand how weird it all was. And thank God that they were there at the time I discovered the pictures, because I'm not sure I'd be able to keep a lid on my emotions if they hadn't been there. While I tried to keep calm, they began to rationalize what we'd been looking at. Their first idea was that some creepy prankster had come along, taken my phone, climbed a tree, then taken a picture of me while I was asleep. And while that wasn't entirely out of the question, since my shelter was open-faced and it'd be easy to get to me, it was obviously impossible. And when I broke it to him that there were no trees in front of my shelter on that occasion, and that the very reason I'd chosen it was for the views, He actually accused me of being mistaken. It was only when I'd lost my temper that he actually sat down on our couch and just stared off into the near distance. We both knew the photo was physically impossible, so the question was, how could it have been taken? It stayed on our minds for days afterwards, and no matter how hard we racked our brains over it, neither of us could come up with a solution. 
Finally, when I approached him with the idea of revisiting Yellowstone to try to get some answers, he flat out refused. Not only that, but he told me that he thought I should just delete the picture to let go of the whole subject. Someone played a prank on him, he said. That, or it's a glitch with a phone or something. Either way, it's just not worth obsessing over. You're okay, I'm okay, we're both still young and sane. It's not going to do anything to compromise that. And he was right, somehow. What answer could I possibly have gotten that was going to ease my mind or make me feel better about the whole situation? Even the Occam's razor explanation creeped me out. That someone had taken my phone out of my sleeping bag, then replaced it after having taken an impossible photo. Anything beyond that? Well, my roomie was right. I really didn't want to know what else it could have been. It was better I just get on with my life, try to forget it even happened. But I still think about it every now and then. I can't help it. And sometimes I think that if I do finally get answers on how that picture was taken, it'll be more terrifying than I can possibly imagine. Have you ever had a hallucination? I have, and it was one of the scariest things that's ever happened to me. At least, I think it was a hallucination. One night I got home from work pretty late after working overtime on a project that was due at the month's end. I was tired, pretty burned out, and definitely stressed, but as a doctor later told me, being stressed and sleepy doesn't cause vivid visual hallucinations. So. Right as you come through the door of my apartment, there's a lamp that I inherited from my deceased grandma. It's one of those old style ones with a fabric shade which has little tassels hanging from it. And after she died and we were going through her stuff, I just couldn't bring myself to throw it out. It probably wouldn't have fetched five dollars at a garage sale, but to me, it was as precious as anything. A relic of a time gone by and a reminder of how magical visits to her house used to be. I'd look at it and smell freshly baked Christmas gingerbread. I'd switch it on and off and feel like she was in the room with me. Not in a creepy way, of course, more like in a very comforting way. But this one evening, I walk through the door, switch it on, and feel my heart getting ready to jump out of my throat. When I looked up, all I could see was naked human bodies. They were almost grey, with a thin sheen of what I can only describe as slime on them. Almost like the kind you see on a baby deer or calf right after they pop out of their mothers. They were stacked on top of each other, some of them maybe three or four bodies high. But they weren't dead. They were breathing and in a lightning flash of realization, I understood that they weren't just unconscious or sleeping. They were being born. They weren't babies either, not fetuses or zygotes or whatever you want to call them. They were fully grown adult humans covered in amniotic fluid, and they were waiting to be born. And then there was the smell that drifted into my nostrils, a scent that reminded me an awful lot of warm milk. As you can imagine, this just about scared me out of my mind. I didn't take my hand off the lamp's little switch, not for a second, and out of instinct, All I did in the moment was switch the lamp off again. When my eyes adjusted to the darkness, I could see that the bodies were gone, but I was so shaken up that I didn't switch the lamp back on. I just walked out of my apartment and began pacing in the hall. When I felt calm enough to enter the apartment again, when I told myself enough times that what I saw was just my mind playing tricks on me, I walked back into the apartment and switched the lamp back on. There was nothing there, just the soft, warm light of my grandma's lamp reflecting back at me off the walls. I sought psychiatric help immediately, and as I stated, a doctor helped me realize that what I'd seen was nothing more than a figment of a fractured and fatigued imagination. 
I always thought hallucinations would be fuzzy or more abstract. Melting wallpaper patterns and pink elephants, that kind of thing. I didn't realize they could present themselves in such intimate detail or be accompanied with things like smells or sounds, like that warm milk smell I detected. But here we are. You live and learn. And I'm thankful to the medical staff that helped me realize that. But in my darkest moments, especially in those that followed the incident itself, I sometimes thought that what happened to me wasn't just some kind of cerebral picture show. That smell, the way the bodies sounded as their lungs drew and expelled breath, that slimy, oozing sound, not to mention the detail on their faces, on their bodies, the moles, the hairs, the birthmark, the scars, I remember it all in such vivid detail. But like the doctor said, it had to have been a hallucination, because you can't just summon something like that by switching an old lamp on and off. We don't live in a world like that. I know we don't, because if we did, we'd hear a lot more stories like mine. Only, I've never actually gone looking for similar stories because honestly, I don't want to know if similar things have happened. Because if I read that they have, that would put a hot needle point to the balloon of my carefully created sanity. And everything I've worked towards over the past 20 years or so could suddenly and violently burst. A few years back, I got a call from a private number. I don't usually answer those kind of calls, but I was expecting one from my local tax office and was told that they call from some sort of private number. I answer the phone and it's not the tax woman. It's some kids saying like, Hello? Dad? When are you coming home? The line was terrible and I could barely hear the little guy, so I had to ask him to repeat himself before finally saying, Sorry, man, I'm not your dad. I think you got the wrong number. Only thing was, the voice sounded weirdly familiar. So my first thought is that it was a second cousin or one of my friend's kids getting the wrong number or something. It was only a little while later that I realized who it was on the other end. It was me. The night my dad took his own life, I called him and asked him the exact same thing. He told me he'd be home in the next few hours, but he didn't ever come home again. I can't explain how or why it happened. I just sank my head into my hands and cried. I'd never told anyone this story, but I'll tell you because I suppose it doesn't matter either way. You don't know me. I don't know you. And if we did meet, you'd never know it. But it happened. And I know it must have happened to other people too. I just wonder how many, and if it'll ever be properly explained. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data. Located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And I'll see you again soon.